Welcome to Genuine Life Recovery. We're here to help you and your loved ones overcome addictions and other addiction-related mental health challenges. In this show, we dive into the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of addiction, mental health, recovery, family dynamics, codependency, and more. You can listen on your favorite app or at jodystevens.org. Genuine Life Recovery is made possible by great friends like Joshua's Heart in memory of Joshua Brent Moore, bringing hope, love, and awareness to those afflicted by addiction online at joshesheart.org and Jody Stevens Productions for commercial voiceover, narration, production, MC, and public speaking online at jodystevens.org. Hey friends, welcome back. We are joined by Simon Andrade. He is the host of the Free and Redeemed podcast, which tackles real life issues with a Christian perspective. And this is cool that you're back because I was recently featured on your show where we talked about addiction and recovery. And that was super fun. And now you are back on my program and we are talking about a very interesting topic. One I don't know a ton about. Mm called trauma bonding. So this is a kind of a cool topic. So Simon, thanks for being back and thanks for hanging out. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. Are you in Texas? I forget where you're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm in San Antonio, That's Texas. Right. Okay. Yeah, so born and raised. <laughs> what got you into ministry and starting this program, your podcast mm-hmm. actually? I mean, so it's kind of a long story, but to kind of just briefly explain. So, yeah, I've been a Christian for almost 11 years now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a really good journey. Long story short, things have been tough or things got tough a few years ago. Uh, went through a really strong depression during the year of COVID. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, I went through a lot of stuff, but it was ultimately, you know, when I went through a healing process and really kind of rededicated my life to the Lord is when I really kind of felt a tug in my heart for him to get me to start this podcast show and speak about uh, real life scenarios that I feel like as human beings, we all go through. And uh, we definitely have an answer and a solution and that's Jesus himself. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of a long story short of how the Free and Redeemed podcast was born, basically going through depression, going through heartbreak, going through all this strong stuff to, you know what? God was my ultimate solution. So, Mm, yeah, well, and I'm sorry to hear that you went through that. I'm Mm -hmm. glad that you're using it for good. I like this topic of trauma bonding because it brings up a lot of stuff for me, but, you know, I tend to tie everything into this concept of addiction and recovery because Mm -hmm. you can be addicted to so many things, but, you know, like when we describe sort of textbook codependency is it's considered addiction to other people. So one could say if someone's trauma bonded, depending on the situation, there could be some codependency root issues or not knowing who Mm -hmm. We are, or I think we talked about this last time, sort of the internal versus external locus of control and, you know, stuff like that. Um, Mm -hmm. So, but, but talk to me about trauma bonding and specifically what it is. Cause I think when most people think of it, Mm -hmm. they're going to think of big stories in the news where someone is kidnapped and they bond with their captive or captor or someone's in a war war you know where they're they're in a concentration camp and they they bond with <laughs> yeah. their captors which is that is true yeah yeah <laughs> but there's a lot more to it than that yeah no absolutely so i want to start off by using the key word here trauma the way i always got the definition of trauma was and it's from one of the famous books from Dr. Bessel A. Van de Kork, um, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. And oh, course, my a- gosh. <laughs> I started reading yeah. that. It's like so intense. I, I read like four chapters and then had to completely stop because it's, it's a long book. They basically pioneered this idea mm-hmm. of yeah. what happens to our body during trauma. And anyway, we that's a yeah. whole other subject. <laughs> that but, is a whole other subject. But it's, but... A, it's a great book about what trauma does yeah. to us. The definition I always got from trauma, you know, growing up, I never really knew what that word was. You just know it's a tough, intense word. Mm-hmm. But Bessalay van der Kork really always described trauma as like an imprint of some on somebody's life. And I it was almost like the comparison of the analogy of being branded, you know, and you see like ranchers or farmers branding a cow and that imprint of the brand is left on their skin. That's how I could really describe trauma. Like trauma is like something that like a branded dark experience that occurred in someone's life 
And everywhere they go, you know, their life experiences, you know, they just carry that brand of trauma with them. Yeah. And it could be, you know, experiences that some people may see as normal, but to them, it's like one of, you know, it's like those dark memories, those dark uh, experiences that they went through. For example, you see people who can't even get in a car and drive anywhere because they went through an accident that almost killed them. You know, they panic the moment they get behind the wheel because yeah. the trauma, traumatic experience of being in a car accident. But to use the second word bonding. So bonding is, I feel like it's a blessing from God. Uh, God has given us the privilege of bonding with just so many people that we have in our life and it could be relationships that we were born with including our parents family members and just going through life you know making friendships getting in relationships and bonding is like when two people have a mutual experience of getting to know each other getting close to each other and if you put those two words together i think the better way i could really describe trauma bonding is basically two parties that are coming together and have some form of an attachment Mm -hmm. However, there is like almost like a chemical imbalance in that attachment. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> you have one party who is obviously going through abuse, mm -hmm. going through something that is definitely new to them. But at the same time, and I'm going to get probably more into this later, but going through an abusive situation and you have one person who is either intentionally or unintentionally abusing the other party. Right. But the most unique thing, and I think this is where it could really apply to your show, Jody, about addictions, and we're talking about genuine life recovery here, is from the outside looking in. And in the famous book that I personally learned about trauma bonding, uh, it's, uh, of course, that's the name of the book, Trauma Bonding, by <laughs> um, the author was Dr. Anley Alexander. Uh, basically, it's like from the outside looking in, you can see this certain relationship and anyone from the outside can say this is abusive, this is toxic, this is destructive. But you actually find the person being abused is actually still drawn to the abuser. They're still going to the abuser. They're defending the person. And they're still chasing after them when you could look outside and say, man, that is so unhealthy. Yeah. And I think that's so destructive about the idea of trauma bonding because um, I think the situation about it is I feel like a lot of people today don't realize how common it really is. And some people who may be listening may be thinking, as you mentioned, well, you mentioned the concentration camps, you know, bonding with the captor. Uh, maybe common ideas could be a boyfriend and girlfriend type of relationship or a marriage between, you know, two people. And even though we can say, yeah, those are very common, this could apply to anything. Um, it could apply to the idea of, let's say, a mother and her a daughter or a father mm -hmm. and a son or vice versa. It could be an employer at work, employer and employee. It could be a friendationship, which I really kind of want to use my story in this specific area, or a situationship between two friends. Uh, and, you know, the list goes on. But I think, you know, one thing that all these types of different types of relationships have in common is, you know, the person who's going through a tough time or who's chasing after another person it's like they still think that they are going to get something out of the relationship. And in so many words, I guess the gist of defining trauma bonding, I think, is it's almost like you broke me, but I still believe you can fix me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to laugh like that's totally not funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's heartbreaking. But it's when you say trauma bonding, the other thing that comes to mind is a lot of people that get in trauma bonds come from trauma. So I think that's yeah. important too, right? So we, we learn this stuff a lot of times. We may have been trauma bonded with an abusive parent or something like that or neglect. Like I think there's mm -hmm. usually, don't you think, Simon, some kind of root mm -hmm. of neglect there. So there then we go and we end up in the, in the same situation all over mm -hmm. again. Yeah, yeah. And that's so funny you mentioned that because I think what's very unique about uh, trauma, you know, even though it's a dark experience and it's an experience that could stay with someone, you know, to them, they think it's normal. To a person, trauma actually becomes a normal type of situation in any type of circumstance mm -hmm. i guess a better way to describe that i like how you bring up going through trauma in the past i believe we even talked about this on my show when we talked about addictions and we kind of got to the external parts uh i said there's the idea like you're addicted to something and it's because it was normal to you as a child mm -hmm. and here you are embracing it here you are chasing it because you still have those same 
same feelings you had with the child. I even talk about the concept of falling in love with your parent when you grow up. <laughs> yeah. You know, you go through the abuse, okay. let's say with a narcissistic parent who maybe wasn't there, mm -hmm. maybe never really made an effort to spend time with you, but still acknowledged you as, let's say, as a parent. And you end up, let's say, getting in a relationship with someone who gives you a similar experience to yeah. they acknowledge you, but there's that idea of liking to be chased by you and not really putting in the effort that you're putting in with them. It's something I think I personally learned in my life that I never even knew was there. And it's something I felt like, you know, I give glory to God for revealing this in my life when I went through a dark time mm -hmm. with someone who I was, um, who I began to grow feelings for in my church and uh, someone, and it's crazy, you know, looking back on this experience, it was someone who I never really considered that I would want to date, but I think it was just, and that's what I'm talking about bonding friendships. I feel like could even sometimes rather if we know it or not could really leave a lasting impact on us. And we may not even realize it till, you know, things start happening, but yeah, I guess to allow you to speak a little bit. Yeah. That's how I could really, talk about uh, with trauma bonding, because when I really got into this dark experience in my life recently, you know, th through the help of counseling, and definitely through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I actually realized it tied a lot back into my relationship with one of my parents uh, mm -hmm. growing up. Yeah, and it started putting all the pieces all together. And it's like, Oh, my gosh, like, this was normal to me as a kid. And here I am still living, living off of this mentality, this closeness codependent mentality as an adult. When I think of trauma bonding, I also think of attachment and attachment yeah. issues. So for a child, they will choose the attachment over authenticity. And, and what that mm -hmm. means is if I'm your mom, Simon, and I say to you, you know, don't cry, I'll give you something to cry about, mm -hmm. you know, no cookie for you. You know, you're going to stop crying. You're going to stuff those feelings. You're going to become something else. And you're going to mm -hmm. keep, you're going to become a different person to try to get those needs met, right? Yeah. And then as you get older, you kind of don't know who you are. So you have that, I think, where it then it can be easier to fall prey to the, the trauma bonding, the dysfunctional abusive relationship, because you don't really have a strong internal sense of self, right? But then yeah. also, I think maybe like, and maybe you can relate to this with uh, your trauma bonding experience, which I'd love for you to talk about, where uh, unconsciously, we tend to try to fix the what was broken with the parent. Mm -hmm. So we go back to that same <laughs> dysfunctional relationship and we're and 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 we a lot of times it's unconscious like we don't know we're doing it we keep repeating this cycle thinking oh it'll be different this time and it'll i'll fix it yeah. and then we have to learn that there's no fixing it unless until we get into this you know C can you relate it's to that at all with your experience absolutely no yeah absolutely and it's funny you brought that up because recently i just uh had my first session in therapy after quite some time with my uh -huh. counselor. And one of the things I talked about, and I guess to kind of really piece into with my testimony or get into my testimony. So about two, a few years ago, um, you know, I was really committed to a young adult ministry. Things were really going great. Um, very steady. And I think the most unique thing, and I really want to like kind of pinpoint this certain thing or pinpoint this certain moment in my life uh, during this time was I was so focused on my relationship with God. I was focused on trying to figure out a career. Keep in mind back then, podcasting wasn't even a thought back then, but uh, this was actually about five years ago. So a young, young woman comes into our church, start off as friends, everything's going good. Um, but I think when I really started to kind of see a change is when I was always seeing this person all the time at social events and the more I really started to talk to this person, the more I really found myself feeling a certain way, or it's just like make this person really knew how to make me feel a certain way. And I really felt like I was drawn to them. But I think the conflict I knew that was there was this person was in a serious relationship at the time. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy, it's like, you know, you know, that this is definitely a red flag, and it's toxic. There were times where I started to walk away and say, okay, I see these red flags. But I think something that would really draw me to this person was, I guess, the approach. And I really kind of want to dig deep to identifying what I mean by uh, 
someone being drawn to another person. This person, I noticed like our interactions uh, started becoming really flirtatious. Um, I found myself always wanting to talk to them. And then it's just like, before I knew it, it's like attention was always being given. And <laughs> as much as I knew it was wrong and I wanted to step away, it's like, it was always kind of like, it would always kind of come back into my life. Mm-hmm. But I think that what made where I can say the trauma bond really started happening was when it was at a social event. And this is why I really want to stress this to believers today, because some believers think, okay, this is, oh, this is like outside of the church. This is just for certain people, like in workspaces and in schools and everything like, no, this could happen in your church. Cause let me tell you, the enemy is out there and he knows how to distract people. Oh my goodness. It yeah. happens all the time <laughs> yeah. in the church. And, and yeah. I feel like a lot of times in the entertainment piece of the church, you know, I've been in the entertainment industry 30 years mm-hmm. and a lot of times it does happen in the music and the worship leaders and, and stuff like that, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but it is very common because it's um, a place where people have big platforms and stuff like that just happens. And yeah. <laughs> it is, I, I wish it was less common in the church, but it's not. It's just yeah. not, unfortunately. Yeah. No, yeah. And that that's, uh, it's it's crazy to mention that because, um, yeah, I guess fully kind of continuing with the story. Yeah. I guess when I really started to see that things were really off spiritually was when it was at a pool party. The person who she was in a relationship with was not at that pool party. And one thing to even mention, too, is a lot of our flirtatious and private conversations were all in private. Like a lot of people were not aware of this in the church. And yeah, going back, it was at a pool party. Um, things kind of escalated. Tension really rose. And before I knew it, I found myself like, man, just wanting to text this person, wanting to like, you know, really addicted to the process, addicted to the cycle. And I'm going to get to that mm-hmm. later towards the end of the episode. But um Long story short, um, I found myself really addicted to this person, like always wanting to talk to them. But I think what really made the experience uh, very traumatic was it was always off and on. Um, Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, this person wanted to try to work out this one relationship that was not doing good as as we um, as well. And I found myself just in a state of not really respecting myself, not respecting my self-esteem. And I always, and I was telling my counselor this, like times when I realized, you know what, this person is not serious about me. It's not going to result in the way I want it to be. It's not even a good situation. I need to walk away from this. You know, poof, this person would come right back into mm-hmm. my life, showing the same exact attention when things were at convenient times. And it was when this person was no longer talking or no longer in the relationship that they were in. And it was a cycle that went on, believe it or not, Jody, for about two years. Oh, wow. And, and they uh, knew they knew when you were pulling away and then it's the real you in and push <laughs> you out. And yeah. so, so I think with trauma bonding, it doesn't always have to be, you know, we're, we're <laughs> you know, it's not always physical abuse. It's a yeah. lot of different types of yeah. abuse and, and yeah. it can even be spiritual, spiritual <laughs> abuse too. Yeah. It sounds like there was a lot of that, a lot of different things going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I guess to really cut to the chase point is I found myself leaving that young adult group feeling really down, feeling depressed. And it's like it became a situation where it was not even about going to church to serve the Lord, going to the church to embrace the body of Christ. It was more about in a selfish way, going to this young adult group because I, you know, am I going to get attention? It's like, you know, taking me outside the will of God, but I went through a stage of feeling rejected. And then of course, when I was, when I opened up about this to leadership, people in leadership didn't really know how to handle this situation since it was not so much of an exclusive relationship. Mm -hmm. So before I knew it, it's like, that's what made the traumatic experience even more traumatic because it's like, people don't know how to handle a situation like this. And no offense, but (laughs) thanks to the church, they're really good at making your trauma worse. Oh God. Yeah. um, And I love the church, but I, I, you know, you're right. They they need more mental yeah. health specialists and things like they're getting better at, at yeah it, it there it is getting better but yeah but, um well tell me like so mm-hmm. you had to heal from this you had to realize yeah like, how did that work where you were like okay something's wrong something's broken in here i'm 
I'm attracted to these these people that are manipulative. Sounds like there was narcissism. Maybe she mm-hmm. was a narcissist, right? You know, we mm-hmm. like to throw that around a lot, but that is a co- more common thing. So how did you kind of see what was going on and begin mm-hmm. to heal from that process and understand what was happening? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up because um, it all started. It was like, I believe it was the month of October, we all had a little hangout at the church and I remember telling my siblings about this, but I remember it was like when I really knew something was off was when my happiness, when my confidence, when my self-esteem was so based off of something so small and it was just a bread breadcrumbs for attention. Mm. And this is like, this is like, you know, a message to people who let's say may be in a relationship, you may be single and you want to date, you want to, you know, you want someone to pursue you or you want to pursue. But I think, you know, what I, when I really learned that something was off was when I was outside by myself, every, all my friends in that specific young adult group were inside having a blast, just having a good time, like doing their own thing. And here I am saying, you know what, I'm not happy. And I remember praying to God, like, God, I don't respect my, myself right now. I feel like my insecurity is really weighed down by this certain experience, by these multiple experiences. I'm like, God, I just remember praying like, Lord, take me on an adventure. I think it's time for me. I really want to heal. What is the right direction? And unfortunately, you know, and I said the word, unfortunately, you know, God really put me in a position to take a step of faith and it was to take a step away from that young adult group Mm -hmm. because there was the pressure of, Hey, just move on, move on from this understand it for what it was but still be there in the same situation when you're vulnerable to what you're experiencing if that makes sense yeah it was a step of faith and it really just came down to one day having an encounter with the lord uh, in a dream where you know it was like hey there are other people in the body of christ outside of the church that can help you and it's like it was only a matter of me choosing to take that step of faith instead of like instead of having a people pleasing mentality it was like man I need to focus on Christ. And I think the way I really need to focus on Christ for me to find my healing was to remove myself from that, the distraction Mm -hmm. that was taking away my intimacy with God. So yeah. And long story short, I guess, to finish this off, I went through a season of, you know, you know, you feel used, you feel like, did I do something wrong? Where did I go wrong? Was I reading too much into this? And then, and like I said, I want to go deeper into how you can tell you're in a trauma bond Um, and I'm only, I know I'm only specifically talking about my situation, but I was really reliving some of the after effects of it, blaming myself, you know, believing I was being too sensitive, believing that how I handled it was all on me and not on this other person. And I remember there was even a time where reconciliation was even possible. Uh, when I started going through a process of healing, I started seeing a counselor. I went to a men's group. I connected with other young adults and, all the people in my life, I, I I find that as a blessing because God was able to really show me like, you know what, your life is special. Your life can be special without this experience that you only think you're worth for. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I tried, long story short, I tried reconciling with this person. Person heard my apology out. But I think, you know, one of the things maybe I would, looking back, I would have said this a different way, but I wanted to let this other person know that I was hurt too in the experience and this person did not take that very well. And last thing they said on a text message was you need to understand you're not the victim. I don't need to apologize to you. And what does that do? And that's the effect of trauma bonding is there's effects that come after it. It's like you go through an effect of shock, you go through an effect of denial, you go through an effect of unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and depression. And boy, did I go through that. It really took one day having a phone conversation with the pastor who I didn't even know who he was. All I know is I was connected to an online ministry. And when you talk, when was the point when God really healed you? Check this out, Jody, because I didn't even say this uh, last time when we did this on our show, but I was angry. I was upset. And I think what made the experience even harder is when you build feelings for someone and you have to see that person you have feelings for affectionate with another person they're interested in Mm -hmm. right in front of you. And I was seeing that all the time and it was hard, but I remember talking to a minister who I, uh, on an online ministry I was a part of, calls me up. I'm just telling people I'm going through something. Guys, I need to take a step back from this ministry. They understood, but 
they wanted to be there for me. And the pastor uh, hears me out. And when I tell him what I, I'm currently going through, he only has one question for me. And right then I was like, oh my gosh, like he just says, Simon, I understand what you're going through. But he says, I got one question to ask you. And, he, and I said, what's that? And he said, why aren't you putting this battle in God's hands? Mm. And then he said, you've been trying to fight this battle for so long by yourself. But maybe if you understand that Jesus fights our battles, he knows how to fight. Then you'll actually see that you can find the victory that you're looking for. Mm. And that stuck with me for <laughs> that stuck with me. And I think when I really started to find my healing from this trauma bond, specific trauma bond was you know what? I think when we go through a trauma bond, we think that we need to fight. As you mentioned, we think we need to fix people. We think that we need to fix certain situations. But I think the moment we just take a step back, take a step of faith, we actually realize God is the one who can do the impossible. He can do the things that you think you're supposed to do. But ever since then, it's like, you know, God really restructured my life. And it's like, you know, even to this day, as a matter of fact, I was talking to someone on another podcast show that what ultimately healed me, and this is an encouragement for anyone, like what ultimately healed me is I realized Jesus is not like any person I've ever been a part or bonded with in my life. He's God almighty. And he yeah. is patient with us. When people are impatient with you, he remains patient. I love that. A couple things come to mind. Number one, speaking of Jesus, there's a scripture where Jesus says, he mm -hmm. did not entrust themselves to them because he knew the hearts of all men. And mm -hmm. that oh, just did something to me one time because I realized we can love people, right? But we can't mm -hmm. entrust certain things to them because we know that they're human. The other thing that the Lord did was he put you around healthy people to mm -hmm. help you in your healing and your recovery, because I don't think we're able to see what's wrong until we see what's right. And once mm -hmm. you're in those right relationships and you get a good counselor, you're like, oh my goodness. So he just kind of removed you from the toxicity. And then the other thing that struck me, and this is what you said the last time, was that when you were sort of pining after that relationship and wanting that validation and wanting that you mm -hmm. were in withdrawal from that person. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. just, it's like a drug. It's like <laughs> a flipping drug. And God's like, nope, you know, we're not in it. It's so painful because you want to just, you know, you yeah. want to keep it. It's like your drug. It's like alcohol. Mm -hmm. And he's like, nope, you have to literally detox from it and it's going to be hard mm. and ugly and you're going to want to die but once you get over it you will not need <laughs> that approval or validation from anybody that's what's yeah. very freeing about it yeah. right because yeah. once, once you get that wound like that and he heals it you don't need to go to somebody else to get that you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think what to really kind of uh add on to what you're saying like I think when it comes to going through a detox period, if you're going through a trauma bond is simply just embracing life outside of this certain toxic relationship that you may be yeah, in. Yeah. And I think that was a situation I really had to put myself in. But as I mentioned, the difficult thing about trauma is it's like you carry it with you. You don't just leave it at your house. You don't just leave it at work. You're carrying it with you at the gym. You're carrying it with you at the grocery store. And it's like, you know, it's like a heavy weight, but I think, you know, something that, uh, as you mentioned, like being, putting me around other healthy people, you know, going to a men's discipleship group, it's like, you know, I was able to sit down with men who were open to say, Hey, I struggle too. I go through things in my marriage. I'm going through things in my relationship. I'm going through things in my, with my kids. I remember one specific guy was telling me he's not close to his kids saying his kids are not respecting the idea of him giving his life to Christ, but he says, that's my main prayer right now. But it's like to understand that, you know, we all get hurt at some point of our life. It's like the best way I would say to detox, because here's the thing, you know, when we think about, let's say alcohol addiction or drug addiction, there's a process of, let's say, going through rehab, uh, going through times of like uh, eliminating yourself from that drug and reprocessing yourself. It's the same thing with the mm -hmm. trauma bond or yeah. Yeah. Another word some people use for is like soul ties or just overall attachments. Uh, 
simply just embrace new life experiences. And one of the ways I did that is connect with other people. Be open, like have people that are going to be supportive, but at the same time, a little bit direct and making sure that you're going through the right direction. Um, yeah, start new things in your life. And sometimes I think God will honor that uh, when you're going through a detox period. And of course, as I mentioned, it's still going to be painful. It's still going to be hard because you are going to go through a withdrawal of, you know, wanting, wanting that back. And I know I personally went through that as well, thinking that I was only good enough for attention when now, even at a period in my life right now, it's like, God is like, you're worth the whole entire meal. And I think that's one simple way you can say how, you know, if you're in a trauma bond is if you're giving this person a buffet of yourself and they're just giving you breadcrumbs in return. Mm. Yeah. And that could be at a job, like you are giving your all at this job. And it's like, your boss is saying, okay, well, you know what, you still don't deserve that promotion, even though you helped me get this sale, you helped me get this done. Or it could be, you know, a, a, as a parent, you're doing a lot of things for your, let's say, a, an abusive parent, an emotionally abusive parent. And this parents, well, I wish you would have done it this way. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it could be, you know, it could be a whole list of things. But I think what we need to understand, since we're talking about narcissism, it's a key word, but I think the unique thing about narcissism is I feel like most narcissists don't realize that they are narcissists. Or sometimes there is a case where they do know. But I think narcissists behave and operate in a certain way in relationships that to them is normal. Yeah. And when people get hurt and offended, they become defensive. Like, no, this is normal to me. And it's, right. you know, and then that's where the toxicity really comes in. Mm -hmm. or whatnot but yeah um it's that I, it's that yeah. dance because if you look at the root of oftentimes people that struggle with codependency issues or that are attracted to that narcissistic relationship they struggle with the external locus of control or knowing who they are and so they need the outside validation right and that approval and then the narcissist is the same way yeah. they have all that deep shame and they need that narcissistic supply so it's all like on this spectrum you know where you see that mm -hmm. dance going on where mm -hmm. we're, we're they're both kind of getting something out of the relationship you know yeah yeah yeah, no. And, you know, um, a question that I think some people may wonder is like, is trauma bonding a biblical uh, subject? And I don't really have a specific scripture where people I can just say, oh, here, you know, it says trauma bonding in Proverbs something or Psalms something. Right. <laughs> but I can say, you know what, the Bible doesn't just have verses, it actually does have stories in the Bible, with people that we can relate to that God had his hand on. A good example of a trauma bond, I think, could be uh, Jacob and his brother Esau. If you think of the story of, you know, Jacob and Esau, Esau initially was supposed to get the birthright. Yeah. But we think of like Jacob trying to be putting himself in mischief, like, wait, wait a minute, I want the birthright. So what does he do? He manipulates Esau, yeah. knowing that he's hungry, like, hey, I'll give you what I'll give you my soup if you trade in the birthright to me. Right. And then and you then, see his mother doing like you see. Yeah. And then it's like Jacob. See where it comes from, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. I think the probably the perfect example on a romantic relationship standpoint of a trauma bond. And I know we talked about this in our um, my podcast show, but it's Samson and Delilah. Oh, my goodness. And that was yeah. a story uh, I, I really related to. I mean, what kind of girlfriend asks you, what's your weakness? What needs to be done for you to lose your strength? Samson makes up a lie, thinking that it's going to keep him safe. But the very next day, what you told your girlfriend happens to you. <laughs> and she gets pissed about it saying you lied to me. I mean, if that is not the most obvious sign that this is a red flag, I don't know what to say. But it's just like, even this is what I'm talking about trauma bonding. Samson probably recognized what she was up to. But it's like, it's that draw on you know being drawn to that person still even though you know that, that it's not a right relationship for you other examples and i think this is a really key one is david and saul oh my uh -uh. goodness yeah king david and saul i mean saul literally was trying to kill david after you know and this is after david did a lot of things like kill goliath and really help rebuild israel when they were going through a downfall and saul obviously let envy get to him and then tries to kill David. But it's funny how you see throughout 
scripture, David is still honoring Saul. There's a point where mm-hmm. Saul is asleep with his men trying to go out to kill him. David's in front of him holding a spear. His men are like, do it, do it, do it. This is it. And it'll be over. Yeah. You'll be king of Israel. And he's just standing there and he does not want to kill yeah. King Saul, even though he's causing a lot of destruction in his life. Even Jonathan and David, you know, obviously a lot of people in the Bible, you know, describe them as a really close friendship. But I think if you really dig deeper into the story, when Mm -hmm. David was running for his life and Jonathan, of course, was covering for him, there's a part where you actually find out, is he doing this for his own benefit? Mm. You know, is he doing this to protect himself? Because back then, and it was like a tradition for kings. If a new heir took over for a king that wasn't part of his family, the new king would kill all of you know the former king's family and then start you know the new heir right well jonathan if you think about it it's like well crap i (laughs) i don't want king david to kill me so let me get as close to him as possible but let me still also try to see if i can build a connection with my dad but you talk about you know what's normal growing up what you're reliving as an adult there's a scene or there's a part and i can't really uh i don't really know the exact uh book or the exact chapter in first samuel when yeah when david's running for his life and king saul he's eating dinner with jonathan and his uh, men and there's a part where he says where is the seed of david oh yeah and then he finds out and the first response out of saul's mouth is you stupid son of a whore you know and then just completely insults his own son so most people that go through trauma bonding, yeah, is it's almost like the effect of going through a father wound or going through a mother wound growing up. And when they connect with other people, it's like, you know, they connect in the ways that they were influenced by. And to really get into a more deeper example, it really comes down to, I think, the most manipulated person, or excuse me, uh, the most manipulative person in the Bible I do want to just say though, really (laughs) quick with, with the David and Saul thing, you know, you look at David and how Mm -hmm. they found him herding sheep and they thought all his brothers would be the best King, but not little David out with the sheep. So it makes you wonder with Saul, (laughs) if there wasn't like a daddy wound where he just really (laughs) wanted this Saul to love him and he wanted to impress him. And yet then here Saul is just jealous and how that is so hurtful when a parent becomes jealous of a child. It is, that is a deep wound. So I just wanted to point that out where I could (laughs) see that trauma bond where, where he's like, he's King, but he's kind of this father figure and wanting Mm. that love. Um, Yeah. And I bet I know you're going to go to the next one. I bet you're going to talk about Jezebel. That is just, <laughs> yeah, she's, she's you answered the, it right away. Well, yeah. I think, but she's the, so a lot of people, mm-hmm. um, when, when you, because I've done a lot of cross-referencing on narcissism and biblical narcissism, and a lot of people in the church think that narcissism is actually the spirit of Jezebel. So there's actually books about that. So yeah. it's it's interesting, and I could see where that could, where that could, could mm-hmm. possibly be true therapy calls it narcissism church calls it jezebel, it jezebel? are they the same thing i yeah. don't know but anyway i <laughs> yeah. digress so to answer that question so yeah jezebel all we could really say is you know she was a woman with impact uh, she was a woman that yeah. had strong impact and jesus i think actually really warns the church about this in revelation 2 yeah. uh, i believe it's verse 23 When he's speaking to the church of Thyatira and he says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she has been seducing my servants into falling into sexual immorality. Since she, I've given her time to repent, but since she refuses, I will cast her onto the sick bed and anyone who commits adultery with her. (laughs) Yeah. I read this verse a thousand times, but (laughs) anyone who commits adultery with her will go through great tribulation unless Mm. they repent. So Jezebel was married to King Ahab, who was supposed to take over the throne of Israel. You know, she talks about, um, and I want to really highlight this point when I talked about, I noticed when I was so drawn to the person I was attracted to, I realized it was, it was no longer about serving God. It was about giving attention. Well, she, if you think about the spirit of Baal, she creates prophets for Baal and create builds a new god for israel which was this you know the god of baal baal in most terms people believe that 
it's simply removing God out of the picture. Mm. I feel like the spirit of Bell, I think, is very active in our world today. Yeah. You think about how prayer is not allowed in modern day churches. You know, instead of saying God, we have to say the universe, taking Christ out of Christmas. Now it's Xmas or happy holidays. Mm -hmm. But point is, I think the spirit of Jezebel, ultimately, it's like removing God out of the picture and, you know, distracting you out of, you know, your relationship with God. Point is, she manipulated Ahab. There are so many stories like when she, you know, Ahab wanted a vineyard, the inheritance of a vineyard. So what does she do? She goes, I'll get that for you. And lies, makes up a note, gives a false message to a prophet. They go to the owner of the, and of course, I wish I knew all these biblical names, but they go to the owner of the vineyard and she has, she has them killed. It was like so, nah Nahab or no. Yeah, or Nahab. Like and then I think Baal, something, the, something Baal was Jezebel's father, if yeah. I remember correctly. So <laughs> the whole, that whole demonic spirit, again, mm -hmm. you see just the family the mm -hmm. way it just triple trickles down trickles from down mother yeah. to father to son to daughter and mm -hmm. great you know just yeah. that, those um generational mm -hmm. curses yeah but at any rate yeah so she and she had an impact on other men who were not obviously with her like her husband ahab who was very passive and allowed her to do what she wanted and basically yeah. she, she was pretty much the queen of israel Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. basically did everything for Ahab. She basically wore the pants in that marriage. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you think about Elijah. Elijah had it rained down fire from heaven, was the only prophet who was still attached to God and had all the prophets of Baal killed. And the moment when she threatens, you know, she threatens Elijah, what does he do? He runs for his life, yeah. hides in a bush, and like prays to God that he might die. Why does he care so much about the opinion of a woman, just one woman who doesn't even like make an effort to kill him, but basically threatens to kill him. And he goes and agrees. And you see, there's the spiritual side to trauma bonding. But then the next person who was bonding with uh, Jezebel was Jehu. When Jehu was sent to clear out Israel and rebuild Israel, obviously Jezebel, as God prophesied, was going to die by getting eaten by dogs. When he's going to her house, the Bible says she stood by the window and put on makeup mm -hmm. yeah. and actually intentionally tried seducing Jehu. Mm. But all these biblical examples I can give, and there's so much more we could use, but I guess for time, uh, time constraints, the Bible, I think really ultimately highlights trauma bonding as, you know, it's a way that I feel like a lot of us could really be impacted. I feel like trauma bonding, I think is a way that the enemy could really, one of the big ways that the enemy can take your identity it's funny how you say, you know, going back to King David, how he was, you know, growing up, not being noticed as a kid, not being told, hey, you're going to be something great one day. And of course, going through that father issue or going through that issue of wanting a father figure in Saul. And we talked about that story. Mm -hmm. I mean, we never really talk about of how David was as a father. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was very passive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Allowed That's his true. kids to do whatever they wanted. And one of them actually rose up and tried going against him. <laughs> yeah. Trauma bonding, I think, is very biblical. I think it's still common to this day with multiple people in the church, multiple people who may be listening and yeah. understanding like, okay, well, what are the phases of trauma bonding? But yeah. I, and there's so much dysfunction in the Bible. You know, there's yeah. a lot of shame that people feel now where they think, oh, God would never understand. You know, I'm alone mm -hmm. in this situation no one's been through it you know god yeah. could never god could never forgive me for what i've done it's like okay well <laughs> you should read the bible <laughs> like really yeah. read yeah. what people have been through cuz there is nothing new under the sun you know it is all in there and anytime we make another human being an idol like that we just see mm -hmm how it's going to go badly. We want to look to other people to fix us, to make us whole. It's, it's natural. And mm -hmm. a lot of times if we meet the healthy person, the right person, like my husband's my best friend, but even I know that only God can make me whole, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and so we can't even get it from those that are healthy. We can only get it from God. So it makes mm -hmm. sense that the trauma bonding is so destructive. And then, yeah, you could look at the whole spiritual side. Cause I feel like with, 
with extreme narcissism in the church, I think what happens is it, it it is a personality disorder, but I think it also allows for the demonic presence to come in and mm. amplify it. And so yeah. then sometimes you end up with something so much worse than what you kind of initially started with, if that mm. makes sense. Um, but getting back to the trauma bond. So how do we know if we're in a trauma bond? It's all about really kind of piecing together, you know, the phases of your experience and to really kind of get deep into it. Um, I would say <laughs> the first phase, and I feel like it's very common, and I feel like this is a very common trait, and I know Dr. Anley Alexander really um, captures this, but phase one, I would say, is love bombing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love bombing, I feel like, can be common in different ways. Of course, we think of romantic relationships, but... Love bombing, it's like when you first start encountering this person, they leave a good impression on you. Yeah. You know, uh, in my case, of course, it was like finding myself flirting and getting attention. It's like that emotional high that rose up. But it could be multiple things. And I can feel like boundaries could even be broken even worse. This person may even go as far as saying, I love you. I've never met anyone like you before. Mm. They may really poke at your emotional buttons, your emotional love language. If we're thinking, let's say, of a friendship, because this could be, as we mentioned, Jonathan and David could be a good idea of like, let's say, a man to man or girl to girl friendship. This person could tell you a lot of private stuff about them. They could tell you things that, hey, I normally don't tell people this, but I'm telling you because I really trust you. Mm -hmm. And point is, you really start to build this connection with somebody. And before you know it, that leads me into the second phase. I feel like it could second phase is trust and codependency. Once that person has a lasting effect on you, really leaves that strong impression on you, that's where I can say the addiction really starts. Like you really start to trust this person and start to, you know, depending on them for what you initially got from them. And uh, it could it can range from a whole list of things. But codependency, I think, is already, as you mentioned, a state of mind that someone might have already been carrying with them before this specific situation. Mm -hmm. But it's like, depending on that person to make you happy now and so, and this is kind of like um almost like a warning for someone who let's say is romantically interested in someone if you are constantly thinking about them already it's like you know you know you're going to so see them either at a social event you're going to see them at another date and you always just want to be around them you always just want to talk to them it's something that dr alexander talks about in the book is like you know some people think that's a sign of love it's actually not it's a sign of a wound already which is the sign of codependency because you're already that. idolizing this person counting the chickens before the hatch. And you don't even and, know them. Yeah. Yeah. And then you start to ignore the phase number three. And I call this criticism, but it's like where red flags start coming out. Uh, this person yeah. starts showing a side of themselves that to you and to anyone outside looking could say that's a red flag, but to you, you try to make it a green flag. Uh, this person may shout at you, raise their voice at you because you got into a disagreement with them. There could be other passive aggressive things like this person starts giving you the silent treatment when you're curious, like, okay, did I say something to you? Mm -hmm. Was I a certain way? This person, um, and in this case, like, you know, this person may start flirting with other people behind your back. Or let's say if you're in a relationship. Point is, this person starts bringing out red flags and it leads to an experience where you know, you start becoming confused, like, man, I didn't think this person would be this way. Yeah. And you start building things in your head. And some people call this one itis, but it's like one itis is about this person is going to be a certain way, the way I'm envisioning them, not realizing that they're just a human being just like you. Mm -hmm. But once you really start to see the negative red flags about the person, and you continue to entertain them, you continue to be in a relationship with them and settle with them. Phase four is when it really starts to get dark. And that's number four is manipulation. And that's uh, one key word I really want to use here is gaslighting. So you go through a tough experience. Let's say you have your first argument with this person. Let's say this person does something behind your back or something that ultimately offends you. It hurts you. Gaslighting. There are so many definitions people have. Of course, it, the gaslighting initially comes from that 1930s play of a husband who you know, flickers with yeah. the, the lamps and his wife and makes his wife believe that she's only imagining it just to what manipulate her into getting into a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. And manipulation is a sense of control, but I feel like a really good definition for gaslighting and trauma bonding is this person basically puts their responsibilities, their actions, their words, their choices, and puts it on you and makes you try to take responsibility for it. Yeah. And it could be phrases like, well, I never would have said that had you not been this way towards me. Mm, Yeah. In so many words, it's like, if you're hurt by what I said, then you should not be hurt. I think you're making a big deal out of nothing. I don't need to say sorry, because I think at the end of the day, it was you who made that decision. It was you who made this mistakes. Therefore, and it's like when it really becomes a thing where the weight of the toxicity, I think, is all on you. Yeah. And they try to it's like gaslighting is the escape button. Mm-hmm. Well, the and control- it's, the, it's the projection too. like with narcissism, mm-hmm. they say, if you want to find out what the narcissist is up to, it's exactly mm-hmm. what they accuse you of. So they'll yeah. tell you, what do you mean I'm cheating? You're the one that's cheating. You, have that, you know, and yeah. then you know, they're cheating, you yeah. know, and it's, it's <laughs> sometimes with some of them, like it's almost mm-hmm. textbook. Like it's, they're mm-hmm. actually doing, I was in a relationship with a narcissist once years ago and everything he was doing, he accused me of. I'm like, and I was <laughs> so confused. Cause I was like, I was young and I was like, yeah. no, you're the <laughs> one that's doing that was the yeah. weirdest and looking back i go oh that's what was going on like now yeah. i know <laughs> and that leads me into you know phase number five because gaslighting has strong effects on people yeah. point is it's like you know i feel like people who struggle with narcissism or who have the disorder of narcissism know how to create a good narrative that it seems very um uh very convincing to people looking outside in so some people And I know this could be a tough situation. Some people could be going through abuse and the narcissist can flip it around and say and make it look like the person who is getting abused is the narcissist and they're the victim. Yeah. And if you think about it, that's how Jezebel was able to get a bunch of men killed, how she was able to persecute all the prophets, making making the people in Israel believe that Baal was the true God. Phase number five is it's called giving up your control. One movie I'll never forget. It's uh, it's low key. It's a '90s movie that a lot of people may not be aware it exists, but it was called She Cried No, and it was a '90s movie that came out that was meant to spread awareness for rape victims. And the actors who play in it actually are very iconic '90s sitcom people, and that is Mark Paul Gossler who plays Zach Morris in Saved by the Bell, and Candace Cameron who plays um, DJ obviously in Full House. Point is, the whole, just to quickly go through it, the whole gist of um, the movie is Zach, I'm referring to him as a sitcom name. Uh Yeah, Zach Morris obviously finds DJ very attractive. And of course, he's a part of a college frat team. She just moves in. And when they go, she goes to a frat party with her friends, you know, he tries seducing her. He tries really getting her to cave in and become attracted to him. Well, she's trying to back off, trying to be nice. Well, what does he do? Uh, He gets her to get really drunk. He puts a drug in her drink and takes her to his room. And as dark as this may be to say, he tries raping her. And even though she's still conscious, she's screaming like, no, no. Like she's conscious of what's going on. And he rapes her. Well, the whole dark side of that whole movie is he basically gaslights her. She tries reporting it to the police and she, she goes through a depression and he, one of the things he says is, we had sex. And she says, I shouted no. And he goes, but no, we had sex. You went into my room. He goes, you allowed me to close the door. You allowed me to be this way. And he creates this narrative where people in the frat, people in the university, her own brother, who he's friends with, they all start believing him. And what, and what does she do? She goes insane. And that's where phase five, giving up control, hmm. is you start not trusting yourself. You really start to believe maybe I was being too sensitive. Maybe what they did wasn't that bad as I thought it was. And then that's where you start becoming addicted. Like you start defending this person. They make you believe in your head that their actions should not be offensive, that it's your fault. Leading into phase six is you start to lose yourself. You start to really, you know, and this is something I know I personally went through. It's like you don't trust yourself anymore. You don't know what to believe. And you're just in a situation, I think, where you go into a fight or flight and you see most people that go through trauma bonding when they go through counseling, if they're just getting out of divorce, uh, out of a divorce, they start to really blame themselves. Like I should have handled it this way. I should have been this way. I should have said it this way. 
I think when you really start to blame yourself, some people think that's an act of humility. It's actually not. An act of humility, I think, is really understanding that, hey, even though I might have been victim in this area, it's about, hey, there are er- this is an area I need to heal in. And that's something I know I really needed to do. Mm-hmm. But leading into the final phase is you become addicted to the cycle. And it, it's just the same yeah. thing. You think you're only good enough for what you experienced with that person, but you still go back to them because you think it's going to be like phase one again, love right. bombing. Mm-hmm. You think it's going to be the way all the good memories and it's going to work out this time. It's going to be better this time. This person's going to change. I know they will. But those are the, the seven phases. It's like love bombing, trust and codependency. I I know I called phase three criticism, but I can say phase three could be red flags to green flags or Mm -hmm. trying to get, make a red flag, a green flag. Phase four is manipulation. Phase five, giving up your control. Phase six, losing yourself. And I could say those are seven phases to really look out for if you feel like you're in a trauma bond. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that it can cycle, it cycles over and over again in the same relationship. Mm -hmm. So like, with narcissism or just people that are really destructive and abusive a lot of times you know Mm -hmm. they talk about oh the love bombing and then the discard but that can all happen mother to daughter like in it in its cycles it's like the abusive so so he gains that your trust then he beats you up and then he (laughs) woos you back then the discard and so the cycle can happen over and over again so if you start to notice the cycle where because they're addicted to the cycle too, because they're sick and they don't know how to show love other than probably what they've learned, which is abuse, right? And so yeah. so it could be like, oh, Simon, you're so great. Then, then I criticize Simon. And then Simon <laughs> begins to know that it's building. What's yeah. building up is then mm-hmm. now I'm gonna now I'm gonna beat you up and then mm-hmm. I'm gonna bring you flowers and tell you how sorry I am and how great you and then it's gonna start mm-hmm. over and over and over. And I think, yeah, like those two cycles. So the cycle of ourselves and then the cycle of abuse where where it doesn't change. And so they keep thinking, oh, this is the time. This is the time mm-hmm. he's really gonna change. But until they until they get help. Mm-hmm. That's the only cycle they know. And then us yeah. as the codependent, we get into that cycle. And now yeah. we're both in this like mm-hmm. dysfunctional rat race that will never end until somebody gets out, you know? Yeah, yeah. That that is so good, Jody. And it's, you know, to add on to what you're saying, I guess to kind of be a little bit specific about my experience of the testimony I gave. It's funny you mentioned that because there was an experience I went through, like um Obviously, this person one time, it was a dark period in my life. My grandma was on the brink of passing. This person reaches out to me and wants to meet at the gym with me and another friend of mine. However, I deep down knew I needed to set boundaries with this person. And I kind of like let him know, like, look, I'm just going to work out with my friend, knowing that this was behind the back of the person that she was seeing. She makes a big fit. She gets really pissed off and tells someone in her family and the person in the family gets upset with me. Oh my God. Literally the day my the day my grandmother was passing away oh. and gets very angry. And it's just like, you know, I'm like, I don't need this. You know, it's like, I don't need this situation right now. But mm-hmm. long story short, I'm upset with her. I'm like, gosh, just over you not going to the gym. Well, the next few days later, we go to the gym with my friend. And she sends me a text asking to go again. I ghost this person. I'm there at the gym with my friend as we're working out on the squat rack. He goes, uh oh, uh oh. And then I turn around and she's walking right there behind, right behind us. I give her the silent treatment. I'm like, man, don't even say anything, whatever. Well, later this person says, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know your grandma was going to pass away and shows a side of herself that comes off very humble, comes off very, you know, it's like it was so hard to like just ignore her and not be and be rude to her. Mm-hmm. And before I knew it, it's like I was talking to her again. I was like, you know, entertaining that attention again, thinking, oh, maybe it will be different this time yeah. to go into a bowling alley that same day. And then just being completely disappointed only because finding out she would gotten into an argument with the other person they made up right in front of me. And it's like, you're at that point. And that's where I wanted to add on. It's like, you know, if this person's constantly coming back and it's like, if they're very hard to resist when they're in their sorry 
or not even sorry, but like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be different now stage at the end of the day, it's not healthy, you know, because yeah. it's no boundaries at all, but yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, Simon, this has been, um, an enlightening conversation. I'm mm -hmm. so glad I could chat with you. And I feel like I know a lot more about trauma bonding as well and just <laughs> how it ties into like the addiction yeah. and relationship. It's it's kind of interesting when yeah. we see how all this stuff mm -hmm. kind of cycles together. Um, yeah. What are the books? So we have The Body Keeps Score. And then the other mm -hmm. one was just called Trauma Bonding. Trauma Bonding okay. by Dr. Anley Alexander. Awesome. Uh, Jody, uh, before we leave, I thought if I could just share one th encouragement to, yeah, yeah. to our listeners. Yeah, I was going to say any party words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, if you are in a trauma bond, I just want to encourage people like, here's the thing, being the victim does, does you no good, even if it's 100% yeah. valid. Right. Let me tell you, you know, the way narcissism, I think, is born is I always call it the silent pandemic. The enemy wants to put you through a dark experience yeah. from, let's say, someone who's going through, who's a narcissist. Why? Because he wants you to become one. It's like when someone's angry and hurt or the person who deeply hurts you, you know, puts you through a trauma bond. It's like, you know what? That person probably went through something dark, just like you and as a human being, just like you. So a final encouragement to someone is don't be a victim. Be a victor in Christ. You know, yeah. Christ, yeah. you know learn how to go through forgiveness, learn how to go through forgiving yourself through that process. Instead of like, cause if you're going to, if you want to stay the victim, you're going to be a victim in every situation. Yeah. But yeah, just learn from the, the situation instead of defining yourself from the situation. And that's how you're going to get free. And that's how I got free. But yeah, I thought I'd leave those encouraging words. That's perfect because then, yeah. then see now, Simon, you're the one that can help other people through it. Now you're yeah, the one exactly. as the leader in this area, just like I'm getting addiction counseling license. It's like now, okay, I gone through addiction. Now I can help you get out of it. And that's a beautiful place to be. And that's where everyone's struggling with this. You know, we just want to pray and encourage you to yeah. take the journey, pray, give it to God, and he will come to your rescue. Don't, don't be angry at God and let him let that person steal your relationship with God. Cause I almost did that. I almost did that. Mm. I was so mad mm -hmm. that I almost let the person turn me away from the Lord. Yeah. And I actually had a therapist say, why would you let them take your relationship, <laughs> relationship with, with the Lord? Yeah. <gasps> and I was like, you're right. And I didn't, but we need that help. So reach out yeah. for help. No, totally reach yeah. out for help because help is available. Yeah. We can't do it yeah. alone. We're not supposed to do it alone. Yeah. You no. Know? People so. are not us. Uh, people are not a solution. More, more or less. I feel like people as us, we can be a, a tool for each other. Yeah. But Jesus, I think, is the ultimate solution. And if you're going to bond with someone, bond with him. Yeah. Because he sees you so much more, so much better than the person that may apply to you in this specific episode today. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Awesome, Simon. The podcast mm -hmm. is called Free and Redeemed. Where is it at? Yeah, so uh, you can find it on any podcast directory, Spotify, yes. Apple, Google Podcasts. Uh, yeah, basically, as we're talking about right now, the whole purpose of it is to... Season one, of course, I think is more or less like tackling real life issues today in Christianity or just overall in the world. And what does the Bible say about it and how can we be free from it? But yeah, if you want to find me, you can just look me up on Free and Redeem Podcast. I also do have a website, I blog, and I'm in the works of getting a youtube channel started but uh, that's a work in progress so yeah. <laughs> appreciate the support call <laughs> what is your website it's uh, freeandredeem.net awesome simon thank you so much for being here thank you so much jody it's uh, once again it's been a pleasure and uh god bless what you're doing currently right now in the genuine life recovery podcast Thank you so much, friends, for listening to Genuine Life Recovery, playing on your favorite app or on my website at jodystevens.org. It's J-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, jodystevens.org. There you can check out my podcast, blog, recovery coaching info, speaking, and more. Check it out.